Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Everybody, it is my great honor to be joined today by Linda Villarosa, a distinguished figure um, in the literati and a little bit, well, certainly in the New York Times and in essence before that. Um, and before we begin, let me just read a quick biography for those few among you who don't know about Linda. Linda Villarosa is a journalist, an educator, and a contributing writer to the New York Times Magazine. She covers the intersection of health and medicine and social justice. She is a journalist in residence and professor at the Craig Newmark School of Journalism at CUNY and teaches journalism, medicine, and black studies at the City College of New York. Her book, under the Skin, which we'll show you now, uh, was published in June. Not only was it published, it was widely acclaimed. It was nominated for an NAACP Image Award. It was listed as one of the 10 best books by the New York Times of 2022. I mean, this is really fabulous. Linda has appeared everywhere uh, talking about the book, and we're especially happy to have her here with us today. So welcome, Linda. Thank you. I appreciate um, your interest and uh, being here in being here with you. It's a really fabulous book. But before we get to that, I hope you might indulge me in a little reminiscence of my engagement with your work. Um, in the middle 90s, early and middle 90s, I was able to teach lesbian literature at the University of New Orleans, where I assigned Afrikeet this uh, wonderful collection uh, edited by Catherine McKinley and L. Joyce Delaney in which you, to which you contributed. And I have my copy here and I see that I assigned your essay. And so I reread it uh, in preparation for this interview. And it strikes me as the ideal kind of essay that an undergraduate in the deep South needed to read in the 90s. It's a refutation of all the religious um, bigotry surrounding homosexuality, and it, it's really inspiring. So thank you for writing it, and my students loved it. Thank you. I appreciate that was a very important moment for me to talk about um, the way religion is used against people, <laughs> not just LGBTQ, but often, and the way, um, you know, religion at its core, spirituality is and should be about love. Exactly. And it's funny, as I was teach going to teach that class um, that morphed into gay and lesbian literature and in later years, I was walking down campus and a heterosexual couple was ahead of me and the guy said to the to his um, female companion, it's not that they're bad people, it's that they're sinners. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> <in class>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's move forward. I was privileged to be involved a little bit in the form of an interview with Julie Anzer and Elena Gross, who wrote this wonderful collection outright. Uh, the speeches that shared uh, LGBTQ, that shaped LGBTQ literary culture. And of course, I read your essay. You gave a keynote in 1995. Um, and you made a lot of very important points about yourself as a writer and exhorting the audience to write no matter what and you talked about the importance of writing and that was very inspiring and then I was able to attend on zoom their book launch at the um, LGBTQ center in New York where you were in attendance and in that uh, book launch you spoke about the mother-daughter articles that you and your mother wrote for essence in which you talked about 
coming out to her and so forth. So I was wondering if you could start by telling the audience a little bit about that experience. Well, in um, the, uh, I guess the early 90s, my mom, I was an editor at Essence Magazine, and we were talking about articles for Mother's Day. And I had come out, I was out at you know, among the staff at Essence, and they were saying, oh, be nice if there was sort of like a mother-daughter lesbian article among the other articles. So I thought, oh, my mom could write something. And she agreed to, which was really lovely. And then I realized that the editors really wanted me to talk about my part, like how we, um, how I came out to her, how it was fraught at first, and how we healed our relationship. Um, that article, uh, and we had our photos taken, we did this really intense interview um, with each other. And then um, when it was published, it became at the time the most responded to article in the history of the magazine. Um, we followed up with um, a sort of the letters that came with it. So we talked about how we felt about the letters that we received. And then I think it was, I don't know, uh, 10 or 15 years later, we did another follow up to it. It was like a sort of Essence did the most, the most famous articles in the magazine's history. And they followed up with us. And by then I had children. So it was me and my mom and my two children in the photograph. And I talked about um, being a parent partially because um, I had such a good mother. That's fabulous. And where are are these available? We probably can look them up in the archives or yeah, you can. There, yes. Um, Essence is well archived. That's wonderful. Um, so let's fast forward. I uh, happened to be in Provincetown for the Provincetown Book Festival, and I saw that you were on the roster. So. Uh, was able to attend your book conversation there. And it was really an interesting experience for me because the, uh, the audience was racially mixed. And, you know, you talked about your book and one of the women from the audience talked about being a doula and her experience uh, with racism in um, the medical system. And so it was really an interesting moment because the audience participated. And does this often happen that people give testimonials when you go around on your book tour? I know a lot of it has been on the media, but when and you do it in person. You know, what's interesting is, you know, my book is about, you know, race and medicine and racism in medicine. And when we think about it, you know, we think about this history, um, often there's a discussion of the Tuskegee experiment, which happened in the 1940s, where Black men with syphilis were not given treatment to see the course of the disease by the public health service. So this is like the most infamous moment in history as far as medical racism. But what I find is that people aren't thinking about that. What they're thinking about is what happened to them and what happened to how they've been treated or how their loved ones, their family, their mothers, their fathers, their children, their cousins, their neighbors have been treated. So I get that a lot where people are sharing their negative experience in the healthcare system. Um, and it breaks my heart. And, you know, I think, I think it's so common that it's sort of like, it seems like something from the past, but what I get is that people are saying, this is what happened to me yesterday or the day before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Who was the audience for the book? Well, it was funny because I thought when I was writing it that the audience would be for people in the medical field, right? So it would be like um, medical students, uh, professors at med schools and, and administrators. And um, my daughter, who's very smart, um, said to me, mommy, stop, stop saying, stop limiting yourself to that. Because when she would go with me, me, she would hear these stories of people telling what happened to them, like we were just saying. And then she said, part of the value of your book is lifting up the stories of people who have been harmed by the medical system and making them feel, you know, like I think we're often blamed <laughs> when we're sick um, and making them feel like it's not your fault. It's not that something's wrong with you. The system is broken. And so lifting up those stories and validating and making people feel less quote unquote crazy is um, a good you know, part of your book and is a natural audience. I know it, I mean, you certainly have a general audience as uh, evidenced by the wide acclaim that, you've that the book has received. 
Um, how long did it take you to write it? Well, um, I was supposed to write it in a year and a half, and then this pandemic happened. So I got waylaid because part of my part of what I was doing was writing about um, COVID and um, African Americans. And then the 16, I mean, and even before that, I was involved in the 1619 project. So that was a big deal. So I'm getting pushed farther and farther behind. So I say it took about three years plus 30 years, if you count how long I've been researching, reporting, and thinking about these issues. Um, and I'd like to, I'm watching the 1619 project. What a fabulous production that is. I just saw Nicole last week and um, she, she was really afraid at first about how the Hulu special would go over. And um, now she's, she said she's really proud of it and, uh, and has enjoyed the, you know, the sort of the response to it. And it is reaching a wide audience. We subscribe to Hulu to watch it. Oh, so. excellent. <laughs> um, one thing that you talk about in the book, kind of a through line, is the evolution of your thinking um, about racism, equality, and the health of the nation. In 1994, you wrote Body and Soul, The Black Woman's Guide to Physical Health and Emotional Well-Being, with a forward impressively by Angela Davis and June Jordan. Um, and you talk about how your thinking gradually progressed from that point. I think you were, were you working at Essence then? Yes, and I think the, the goal of Essence in general as a publication, as an institution was uplift. And it was about teaching people, um, women mostly to um, like have better lives and that at each turn, whether it was about health, for me, um, wealth, um, sort of even cooking, everything was about relationships. It was about um, beauty, hair, making your, you know, like lifting yourself up to be a better person. And in doing so, it would lift up the race. So for me, as a health editor there, I thought, if you know better, you'll do better. And if everyone does better and takes care of themselves and their children and their family members, then the whole race will lift the health um, outcomes of the race will lift. There's never been a time where there's been equality in um, black health outcomes. We've always had higher levels of infant mortality, maternal mortality, and certainly lower life expectancy. And But I kept thinking, if I just keep teaching this and I, I give people information, then they will do the right thing. And then this, these health outcomes will change. But no matter what I did, that wasn't doing it. Individual people would thank me and say, oh, thank you for telling me about how to take better care of myself. But it wasn't changing the um, health outcomes of our demographic because that wasn't the solution individual behavioral change is not the solution to structural inequality. And um, you tell the anecdote of your um, pickup soccer mate who alerted you to an important thing that galvanized your work on this book. Can you tell us about that? Um, the, at the time, Katrina Anderson was working at the Center for Reproductive Rights, and we play soccer together on the weekends. So this she was 2018. This was 2017, and I had just written about HIV/AIDS for the New York Times Magazine. So she knew that I was a contributor. So she said, "I've got a story for you." And you can imagine how often that kind of happens, where people go, "Hey, I've got a story for you." So I was like, "Okay, I just want to play soccer. <laughs> Dial it down." And she said, did you know that um, maternal mortality is a crisis here? And we're the only country, the United States is the only country where the number of birthing people who die as a result of pregnancy and childbirth is rising. So I was like, I didn't know that, but okay. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, it's because we have these pockets of extreme poverty in the United States and that's what's happening. And then she said, it's worse for black women that Black women are three to four times more likely to die or almost die in be, related to pregnancy and childbirth. And I'm still kind of like, well, maybe it's because, again, we have income inequality and it's a lack of access to health care or, um, or something like that. And then she said, did you know that a Black woman with a um, 
college education, even a graduate degree, is more likely to die or almost die than a white woman with an eighth grade education related to pregnancy and childbirth. And then she turned to me and she said, don't you have a master's degree? And that's when I started listening to her because it wasn't just this question of poverty, which in itself is terrible. It's not the question of lack of access to health care, which is wrong, and we should have universal health care in this country, but it's something else that even that education doesn't protect you from, and even income and wealth don't protect Black women from having poor pregnancy outcomes. And that's what got my attention. You know, it's interesting, too, because I have a friend in Germany, and we were talking, and she said, did you know? <laughs> and she... The, she repeated that exact thing with that African American women with uh, advanced degrees have um, lower and in, higher infant mortality than a white woman with an eighth grade education. So your work is really important in circulating. I think, from my anecdotal um, experience, one of the most persistent myths that you address in your book is that it's class and not race. That seems to be what people think even now. So your book is really important in redressing or in responding to that. Yes, and I don't want to minimize that class in America is a, certainly a problem and that people who are impoverished have it worse. Um, but we still have to discuss that race in and of itself, separate from class, also affects negatively health outcomes for Black people in this country. And that brings me to my next question, because you have a chapter on uh, West Virginia, chapter seven, and I visited Morgantown briefly, so I was really drawn into the, I mean, it's a riveting chapter, but it focuses on white people. So tell us why in this book about racism, inequality, and in the health of a nation, we have a chapter about white people. Well, I think it's two reasons. One is kind of tongue in cheek. As I said, when I first got the book deal, I said to my editor, you know, this is like a black book. There's a, this is a black book. This is about book about black people, sometimes other people of color, but mainly black people. What do I, do I deal with white folks? And she said, you know, when you're reading a regular book, the normal kind of book that you're kind of reading, then there's that one chapter about black people. Why don't you just have that one chapter about white people? So I knew she was kidding, but then later I started thinking about weathering, which is one of the um, one of the concepts that I discuss in the book. It was coined by Dr. Arlene Geronimus of the University of Michigan, and it speaks to mostly around black people is her area of research who are have to face discrimination day in and day out so much that it creates a kind of, it raises our allostatic load, which means our heart rate goes up too often, our blood pressure, our stress hormones, and creates a kind of premature aging that she calls weathering. And the way she, the, how I know her is it helped explain those poor birth outcomes among educated black women. So if you're battling discrimination and your body is prematurely aging, then that means when you get pregnant, which is like a stress test to your body, that's when it shows up. That's why some of the reason we have poor birth outcomes among you know black women. Okay, so I understand all that. I know Dr. Geronimus and I remember having breakfast with her and I said, Dr. Geronimus, do you, is it only Black people who are weathered? And she said, no, weathering isn't about race. It's about being treated badly. Black people have been treated badly for a really long time, for centuries, and have had to battle to survive, have been blamed for our problems, have been called genetically inferior, all these things, they're stereotypes. So it's created this weathering of Black people. But anyone who is treated badly or marginalized will be weathered. So I started thinking, oh, what about white people in West Virginia? Because that is a place where there's, you know, it's one of the, I think it's maybe the, the largest concentration of, it's the whitest state or maybe the second whitest, also has, it's a place where um, there was an industry that supported it, coal mining, which was very dangerous, which was a dirty and um, bad for your health. Then that kind of went away, the resources were extracted, and then people were blamed for their illness. People are ill there. It's very poor because of a lack of economic um, opportunity. 
So I said, let, let me go there and see if her look, what does her weathering hypothesis look like among black white people who have been treated really badly? And that's why I went to West Virginia. And at the time, and even now, they were suffering from an outbreak of HIV related to inject, injecting drug use. So that in, you know, like in New York City, we certainly have syringe exchange. We've lowered the, you know, HIV transmission. So why in West Virginia, of all places, is there an outbreak of HIV going on now? So that was interesting to me. So when I went, I totally understood it. I saw this homelessness. I saw people blaming themselves for their own um, health problems. And what I saw was, honestly, as an observer and a journalist, I saw people looking a lot older than their biological age. And I remember there was the one man I asked, Mr. Scotty. I said, Mr. Scotty, who, you know, I had been talking to him, this older white guy, I thought, and I said, how old are you? And I was thinking to self, he must be like 70. And he was four, it was like 48. And he just mm. looked terrible because he had such a terrible hard life. And he was, he felt bad about his life. He felt like a failure because that was the storyline. It's like people, especially white people are poor because they don't try hard enough. Um, and black people are poor or something's wrong with us because we're not trying hard enough. And so I included that. And one thing I, I drove down there in like 2020, <laughs> during the, I think it was 2020, during the pandemic, and in you know a state that is real, if you don't mind me saying Trumpy, but I really, I felt like the people were kind. I felt like the people, many of them were broken. And you know I felt a great compassion for them. And I wanted to make sure to include them in my book. And it does uh, verify Arlene um, Geronimus's weathering theory. Yes. So from and she has a book coming out. She, she has a book called Weathering coming out in a couple of weeks. I'm really happy for her. Another chapter that is particularly uh, heartbreaking or was for me uh, is chapter five about environmental justice. In fact, at the end, I did, I confess, I teared up. It's about the story of uh, Danielle Bailey Lash. Um, and in it, you make some startling revelations that were startling to me, but after I read them, they make perfect sense. Um, would you mind just telling us a little bit about um, Darlene Bailey Lash and her circumstance? Well, I met her. I went to the climate reality conference that um, was put on by Al Gore. And believe me, when I went to that conference, it's probably 2,000 people in um, Atlanta. I could count the Black people on one hand. So, <laughs> And if I um, ex exclude myself, <laughs> I barely need the hand. So there was a panel and um, Miss Bailey Lash was on the panel. And I was like, oh, look, it's a Black woman. This is really cool. So I heard her speak. She's from North Carolina. And she um, was wearing a turban over her head. And she was speaking about um, having a brain tumor and that she was blaming herself because she didn't realize that the water she was swimming in, drinking, um, you know, using for recreation was poisoned by Duke Energy. And there was a coal ash problem that she later learned about. She learned about it from her best childhood friend, who is a white woman who had moved away from the area, had read about the coal ash problem, and then warned her friend that you need to get out of there. But it was too late. She was ill. So she told her story and really beautiful in this huge audience with, and Al Gore was interviewing her. And then afterwards, I saw Caroline, her friend, run up to her and took really good care of her. Um, and was just accompanying her so because she had the brain tumor. So I, I interviewed the both of them because I was struck by their you know interracial friendship and just the love that they had. And then um, I kind of stayed in touch and then um, Caroline called me and told me her friend had died of the brain tumor. So then I felt bad that I hadn't really done the kind of work with those two 
um, that I usually do. So I went down and saw, um, Caroline took me, introduced me to her, her friend's family, to the, um, showed me where she lived. We went to Duke, the Duke, we saw Duke Energy. We saw the pollution. She showed me the landfills in the community. And I included their story. And what moved me is one that, you know, this is an environmental justice issue. Why was why did the why did the black folks live closer to the polluting facility? But that is usually the case in America where black people are 75% more likely to live near an incinerator, near, live near a refinery, live near a landfill, live near a dump. Um, and so I understood that. I think. What I also did in that chapter was look at the history of the environmental justice movement. So sometimes now we think of sort of ecology and environmental rights around Al Gore and other sort of activists like that. But really the real environmental justice movement started years ago and it was one of necessity and it was people whose lived experience was living in polluted areas who finally got mad and you know it it sort of was around the time of the civil rights movement so they were protesting against this dumping in their communities unfortunately it still exists but i really wanted to lift up and celebrate that early environmental justice movement where people have been speaking about it black people and other people of color and complaining about our communities being dumped on and apropos of this story you tell there was a protest against Duke Energy and Benjamin Barber was involved. And um, if I may quote you to yourself on 112, you say the homogeneity of the mainstream environmental establishment spurred the emergence of a black led environmental justice movement. In 1990, with the media spotlight on the protests in Warren County, North Carolina, and the evidence from the United Church of Christ study proving that African Americans suffer most from pollution, activists on the ground got little support from organizations like Greenpeace, the National Audubon Society, the National Wildlife Federation, the National Resources Defense Council, the Nature Conservancy, the Sierra Club, and the World Wide Wildlife Fund. In March 1990, more than 100 grassroots activists signed a letter accusing the 10 most prominent environmental groups of racism. This is such a revelation and so important, such important information. Um, you continue on the next page. A 2018 survey conducted by Yale University professor Dorsetta Taylor found that white people made up 85% of the staffs and 80% of the boards of 2,057 environmental nonprofits, despite making up 60% of the population. A 2019 report released by Green 2.0, a working group that examines the intersection of the environment and race, showed that people of color make up only 4% of the senior staff of 40 environmental foundations. That's shocking and awful. So I think it's important that viewers learn that fact, although they absolutely should read the book too. And I think it's important also, what I tried to do is lift up the people who are doing work. And I yes. highlight a guy named um, Bob Bullard, Dr. Bullard who is in out, uh, works out of Houston and he's written so many books his most famous one is called dumping and dumping in dixie and um i was telling him i said i had dinner with him and, and um i said he's considered like the father of the environmental justice movement i said to him you know i read a lot of your books you have like over 20 books they're really similar are you just writing the same book over and over and he just laughed and laughed and laughed. And he said, kind of, because I feel like I have to keep doing this until something changes. And I get that a lot with the people who are my, you know, experts, especially those in this sort of inequality, racial health disparity space, writing these studies, writing these books, just trying to make a dent in this, pro this national problem that we have in America. Well, one of the strengths of your book, I think, is that you include all the information in the statistics, but you interweave it with personal stories, 
which is so compelling, you know, and you mentioned that one of your friends was sick and I thought, I hope it isn't somebody from the book because I feel like I've gotten to know all these people that you have interviewed and interacted with. Um, well, let's turn to your friend and I think the women's movement mentor, Audre Lorde, who um, was, you asked her about racism uh, ever improving and you asked her before she died in 1992 and she said racism doesn't just fade away it goes out ugly and if we have to look or if we look around today at quotation is certainly valid so let me ask you if you had uh if you've had a lot of pushback on the book i have had some I haven't, you know, it's interesting because my book came out on the heels of the 1619 Project. And I think Nicole Hannah-Jones took the brunt of the, you know, of the harshness. Um, and I didn't get that. My book also came out after the murder of George Floyd and our so-called racial reckoning, where people were much more open to hearing these ideas I occasionally get pushback with where people don't, I mean, like, I'm going to be honest, physicians assume because I'm not one and I'm a journalist that I don't know as much as I do. But, you know, I can uh, like play a kind of a smackdown around research and around studies and around the information that I am sure about. There is something going on and I, and I'm, it isn't an individual, you know, blaming doctors or nurses or people who go into the healthcare field, it is a broken system. And it is a system that is based in, in this country specifically that still has stereotypes of black people that have not been erased totally, that have not been resolved, that have been floating around in order to justify slavery and the economic you know, riches that came with it since 1619. So until, you know, it's interesting that, you know, there's so much pushback in general around, you know, so-called critical race theory, which has completely been misused in this argument. Um, and it feels like this is a time when we're, this is kind of the going out ugly, I am hoping. This is the going out ugly because it is so ridiculous to deny the truth of what is going on in America and in the American medical system and in, in the country to people who really should and deserve the information. And we cannot be a good country or a fair country or a just country or a healthy country unless we tell the truth. Absolutely. Um... What particularly surprised you in your research? I think what surprised me over time was I thought that if we just make health care better, then things would get better. And I think about this, there's a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King that talks about, um, I'm going to paraphrase, that in all forms of inequality um, any unfair unjustness in health care is the most inhumane. Okay. That isn't even correct. What Dr. King actually said was injustice in health, not healthcare, health itself. And he didn't say inhumane. He said inhuman. Inhuman is worse. So I think about that. And I think a lot of times when we try to solve the problem of these, you know, it's not just among black people, but our country has the worst um, health outcomes compared to other wealthy countries. We have the worst in infant mortality all the way to life expectancy. And then we have this inequality, these racial health disparities that are really um, frightening and terrible. Um, but it's not just about giving people better health care because our health care system doesn't work that great. It's about oh. changing our society to look at these stereotypes that are harming people, to look at the way people are being weathered because of ill treatment, and to look at communities that have been destroyed and made less healthful by um, centuries of segregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that um, was surprising to me that just giving more health care wasn't enough. And it took me a minute to sort of sort it all out. And I'd like to um, ask, ask you to talk for a minute about, minute about the work of Mary Bastet and the use of the word racism. 
Um, Mary Bassett was wonderfully our commissioner of health in the New York City for many years. And um, she wrote in 2015, a New England Journal of Medicine essay that said, if you want to um, treat it, when you treat black patients, you can't just treat people's bodies, you have to also fight anti-Black racism. And that was a huge deal being in the New England Journal of Medicine. The other thing she did was because she was the commissioner of health, she mandated that all of the employees at the commission of health, which is 7,000 people in New York City, they must be go through some kind of implicit bias training. And also to look at the communities that are suffering the most and put those resources there. It seemed simple, but that was a big step for her. She then um, went to Harvard. She was for, for a while, until recently, the Commissioner of Health for the state of New York. Now she's gone back to Harvard. Um, so I'm very curious to see what she does next, because she's a doctor that is a leader in sort of anti-racism. Isn't she um, your resource who said it's important to use the word racism? Yes, she said, use the word anti-Black racism. And I appreciate that. And to also, you know, not just think that you, if you're a good doctor and treat people, you, you know, you'll cure these ills without also fighting anti-Black racism and calling and got, it out. Yes, and you got some pushback in, um, in a couple of articles where white male doctors said there's no such thing as structural racism, let's leave the word racism out. Remember that? Or yes, and that doctor is no longer at the New England, at whatever, the <laughs> Journal of the American Medical Association for saying that. And I think, you know, I don't, it isn't my place or my even, I feel no joy in saying you're racist. I never say that, okay? And I certainly don't think physicians go into the practice of, you know, their actual oath is do no harm. They don't go into harm people, but if the racism or discrimination or whatever we want to call it is implicit and it's buried and it's just part of the, our landscape and our institutions here in America, you can't help it. But I don't think it's about individuals the same way I don't think it's individual blame of people for being ill. I don't think it's individual blame for people who are harming people. It's a system that needs to be repaired. And um, I had an incident. My partner went in for a, a mole, cancerous mole removal. And the doctor is very, was, is Cuban and he's very chatty. So he said, what are you reading? And I was reading your book. And so I presented him with some of your arguments. And first he went into this whole thing, I'll take out a mole for many color skin and so forth. And hypertension came up and I used the word racism. And he said, no, it's genetic. At which point my partner said, can we please have my surgery? <laughs> um, but so he was just triggered by that. And that's crazy, you know, because I think you're, it's important to use the word because people need to get used to it because it's occurring. Um, hypertension is um, the reason black people have higher levels of hypertension is not genetic, obviously. And I'm alarmed that a physician would think that. And in the, it's been so well um, disproven because there used to be this medication that was specifically um, for black people because under the assumption that our hypertension, our high blood pressure was genetic. So obviously if we have this genetic um, problem, then there must be a, a solution in medicine. Well, that was disproven like 20 years ago. So that's ridiculous. Um, but what is less um, looked at as far as the hypertension of black people is the link to stress, including institutional racism and other forms of discrimination. And that could be you know, the, you know, the problem. So it's uh, sad that he thinks so, that he's thinking so off base. And it's such a no brainer. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned. Um, so what encourages you? I remember when we were in Provincetown, I asked you, how do you keep going with all this awful stuff you're writing about? And you replied that you have a lot of resources and what encourages you? 
And I think the most encouraging thing for me has been, you know, I'm I even despite what my daughter says about who my audience of my book is, I've been to probably 20 medical schools since and nursing schools. And I was at I'm wearing my Columbia nursing school t-shirt that I got last night after my lecture. Um, and these nurses and midwives were so working to be better healthcare providers. These are students, they were assistant professors, they're teaching the idea of the ideas in my book. They raffled off, they bought copies of the book and gave it to students to read, but they were already thinking about these issues. What was really encouraging, even just last night, was this idea that the, an institution like Columbia or whatever medical school is not just this, you know, closed door one way. It's there's got to be more community engagement with the community. That's I mean, if communities like, you know, Columbia is in Washington Heights, which isn't exactly, you know, that's a that's a community that was red line. That's not a rich community. But there must be some kind of ongoing partnership with the people who you serve. And those uh, people that came to my lecture last night understood that. And around the country, when I speak to medical students and nursing students and midwifery students and public health students, I hear that they are trying to do something different. And often change comes from the ground up, if you will. So it's the students who are pushing back and saying, I don't want to use this outmoded textbook. Or um, the, one of the people last night was an instructor and she said she has to use this textbook. And what she does is cross out the things that don't make any sense and said, don't look at this. <laughs> there is no genetic difference in lung function <laughs> between black and white people. That is old and crazy and based on a racist doctor from the past. And um, so I'm encouraged by that movement. I'm also encouraged by our, you know, the, the number of people who are being trained as doulas. Wherever I go, I mean, just recently I was in Montgomery, Alabama, and one of my daughter's friends was so happy. She goes, I just got trained as a doula. And what a doula is, is, you know, is someone who is with a birthing person. It could be not even around birth. It could be someone who's with an ill person, someone who's has cancer and they have this helpful person who is the link between our medical system, which we know isn't always great and is often cold and harsh and clinical and technical and the person who is afraid and needs um, some kind of personal touch. So I love the sort of increase in social justice oriented doulas, community health workers, you know, in other places we see community health workers used as part of the institution of medicine. Here, community health workers aren't paid that great. They're not always part of the institution. They don't even have a consistent name. And so I, I see that as a growth area and a place where we can show that even though we have the most expensive medical system, we still need human beings to help each other. And you mentioned apropos of doulas, Latona, is it Giwa? Giwa, yes. Um, and how she does such wonderful work, especially with some Simone Landrum um, and only got $600 after hours and hours of care and work. So and that I, needs Yeah. And I think part of my work has been to, um, at, the, at the NAACP Image Awards, I ran into Ayanna Presley and have my picture taken with her. So with this wonderful Congresswoman who supports the bill that is trying to lessen black maternal mortality. And one of the, one of the happy outcomes from my um, 2018 America's Black Mothers and Babies story was um, the expansion of Medicaid to cover doula services in New York and also in Louisiana. Mm, that's fabulous. Um... One more question, and then I'd like maybe we have a little more time. We can talk about some uh, some stories that you include. But what's next for you? Um, I'm trying to. Um, I'm still talking about my book a lot, which has been really fun. Um, I teach um, uh, feature writing this semester. Last semester, I taught pre med, which was really fun and interesting and um, valuable to me. I'm kind of thinking, marinating on another New York Times piece. Um, and I'm just um, really enjoying the, you know, the kind of happy outcomes of this book I worked so hard to complete. 
No kidding. Um, what was your process of writing in your outright uh, speech? You talk about confronting the blank page, but you don't really have the leisure, do you? To, from what I've read of your process in this latest book, you don't have the leisure to, to uh, sit down and confront the blank page so much because you're so immersed in what you're reporting on. I um, am very slow as a writer and really have to, I, I take a long time to, and do a lot of reporting more than I need to, to make sure that I understand everything I'm talking about. I'm not a scientist. I'm not that even good at math and, um, and science, but I spend a lot of time trying to learn and understand that allows me to have more confidence as a writer so that I can say things and make statements without having to worry that it's either wrong or I have to have so much backup, you know, and, and kind of research to show that what I'm saying is right. So I'm slow. Um, I also am disciplined. So I don't, I'm not a night person. I get up early. I, you know, read the paper. I have my coffee. I sit down. I write for several hours. I stop. I, exercise. I take my dog out. Um, I do another shift. I stop at six. I don't do anything past six because I know I'll sound start to sound not so good because I'm a morning person. And that's what I do. And I am, I mean, sometimes I'll say, oh my God, why am I a writer? I should have been, my mother wanted me to be a lawyer. I could have done that. I could have had an easier plight while I'm writing. And then I finish something and then and I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a good writer. I love this. I love my byline. So I have a kind of a, a sort of a crazy relationship with writing, but it, you know, I, I know this is my life's work and I know that it does come easier to me than it does to other people, especially sort of long form and big ideas and, you know, lengthy, <laughs> lengthy <laughs> articles and books. Uh, let's step back. In 1986, you wrote the first story about AIDS for an ethnic magazine, in essence. And you have a relationship with a gentleman, gentleman named Cedric Schurdevant, who's with My Brother's Keeper. Can you tell us a little about that? Um, I read in the New York Times in 2016 that if no, the, the statistic that if... Um, nothing changes the lifetime risk of a black queer person, a man or trans woman will be 50%. So 50% of all of that community will be living with HIV. In 2016, we have, we know that there's, you can take medication, get your viral load down to zero, not be ill, not pass it on. So why would that be? Why is this still happening? And then I looked at where it was worse and it was Jackson, Mississippi. My family, my, you know, was part of the great migration, came from Mississippi. And I was like, what is happening there? It's not New York. It's not San Francisco. So I ended up going there to look at, to understand what is happening in that place. And I realized it wasn't a lack of health care. Um, they have really good health care. There's an amazing clinic that is open to everyone. They figured out that Medicaid expansion didn't happen there. They figured out how to make it work. They use the system. One of the uh, most talented HIV doctors ran a clinic there, but it was the infrastructure of the city of Jackson, which was redlined, which was, you know, erased. It's hard to get around there. I waited for an hour for a bus to come. It never came. But I gave up after an hour. And so, but what Mr. Cedric did was this patient navigator who worked for one of the clinics was using his car and using his love to help people on the ground, to get tested, to get treated, to get help, to get um, support. And that was the story I ended up writing um, called uh, America's Hidden HIV Epidemic. And he uh, ran an organization called My Brother's Keeper. My brother's keeper. And I, I I started to think about how many of the organizations around Black health have something like my brother's keeper or our, our people, our problem, our solution or saving ourselves symposium and things like that. Um, uh, we're the ones we've been waiting for. And it's kind of like, well, actually, no, we don't have to save ourselves. This is a national problem. This is the responsibility of a country that we have supported on our backs for 400 years that to take better care of us in and out of the healthcare system. Absolutely. Um, I hate to... Uh... 
Well, there's so many. I, when I started preparing for this interview, I thought it'd be like Brian Lamb. Remember book notes? And he'd throw out these names and, you know, the person the interview, he would respond. But there are so many people in this book uh, that I that had to let go of that strategy. But if you could maybe tell us about Latasha Rouse, that's a really gripping story that you tell in the book. And it's mm -hmm. shocking. Right? And that was right. Yes. And she was telling her story in order for people to understand and stop doing that. So she was a very brave person who told a terrible story. And she was in such pain and, and so fearful about so much blood loss. But to be treated like she was seeking drugs was, you know, simply cruel. And she was hemorrhaging. And they said, well, walk it off. Like, yeah, so she you know, it's the operation of racial stereotypes writ large in that episode. Yeah. Then, as you say, she goes back and talks to um, other healthcare providers and describes her experience. And I think that, you know, it's called co-design. Sometimes it's called that. And I think that is very good. Um, we just can't rely on people to tell the same traumatic story over and over, but we certainly yes. can use those stories as learning experiences to, to change um, people's treatment in the system. Well, let me, uh, I have a possibility of ending for our interview. I'd like to go back to your outright speech and I quote you to yourself, if I may. You say, we have to write the truth with courage and with conviction. She, you say to the audience, ask yourself one question. How am I going to use my special voice and my unique experience to create change. And I have to say, Linda, you have accomplished that goal in this wonderful book. So thank you for writing the book and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I really appreciate the work you do and it's been great meeting you. Um, and, you know, I say to your audience, um, thank you for um, allowing me this time with you and for listening. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.